YouTube, and Tommy Maddox's Facebook page. We're really excited about today's speakers, and it is a dynamic idea that we are bringing to you to bring both rental houses, manufacturers, and the DP together to all get together for a conversation talking about Sony products. I'd like to start off by welcoming the dynamic team. That would be Sean Sims. He'll give a wave. He's the chief technical officer. We also have with us with Sony, we have Dan Perry. He's the sales and business development manager. We have, you give a wave, we got Simon March. He's the senior project manager. And we have from Keslo, Brad Wilson, who is the vice president of uh, business development. And we have Chad Martin, who is the camera service manager. And our very, very special guest today is Tommy Maddox. He is a director of photography and you may know some of his work that is pretty amazing. It's Huge in France, season one, On My Block, season two, Snowfall, season three and season four, and most recently Empire, season six. So everybody welcome. We will be starting off with a slight presentation from Sony, then we'll go into a discussion. And if you have any questions, please just type it in and we will try and get to as many questions as we can at the end of our discussion. So without further ado, let's go with Dan Perry and have a little bit of a history of Sony and the Sony Venice. Thanks, Anne, and, and thanks for having us. Um, just to make sure, am I sharing the am I sharing the right part of the of the presentation again? It looks like. Can you go full screen? Yep, gonna go full screen. There. How's that? Ah, uh, not quite full screen. <laughs> All right, display settings. Uh, I think it's uh, the slide. There you go. You got it. Right on. All right. And thanks for having us. It's 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 great to be together with everybody virtually, which is the way we do things now. But it's certainly one of the things that we miss is is being uh, together with everyone. And it's great to be with you and 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 Caslo and and Maddox. This is this is cool stuff. So we'll just jump through a quick little. Slideshow, and as you mentioned earlier, Simon Marsh, our senior product manager, is on the call. So when we get into deep technical things, either him, he or Chad can chime in, but they'll they'll be able to assist on the deep technical stuff. But um, just real quick, uh, history of Sony cameras. So we started out in '99 with the F900. We moved to the HDC 950, the F23, the F35, um, which really, when you start thinking about as we got into cinematography cameras. The F35 was a was a super 35 millimeter imager. That was a, a big move forward. And then the F3 was a small format, uh, uh, compact super 35 millimeter camera. F65, which was really ahead of its time back in 2011, uh, came out. And then we had the F55 and the F5, which were really successful platforms and, and covered a lot of ground for Sony in, in a lot of different applications. But I think the big thing for us to talk about today is the Venice. And that was, if you look at the history of, of cameras, that's where we kind of took everything we learned and put it into the Venice. And that was through a lot of um, information from, from industry professionals. People who use the cameras all, all the time. But when I look at the, when we're looking at the timeline, we think of 2008 when we had SAG-AFTRA. And there was the, the authorized strike by, by SAG. And then all of a sudden, overnight, pilots moved. They were once going to be filmed and, and episodic should be filmed, moved over to the SAG contract. So a huge demand for digital cameras about that time with, when it was a world event, or, or at least the United States event. Um, and then in 2011, which is about that time, about the F-65, there was the tsunami in Japan. And then that really that interrupted the tape supply of SR, which essentially was the, the lifeblood. So now we're at 2020. Um, we think there's another um, event that we're all going through now that's going to, to change us and change how we do things going forward. So that it's an interesting time because these types of big uh, events tend to impact how we do our jobs. Um, 
big part of that has been the Digital Media Production Center. So we have a spot. We're over in Glacelle Park. We're open just over a year now. And we uh, had our, our place over on the lot at Sony Pictures on Stage 7, where a lot of this information uh, was 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 given to our engineers on Stage 7, talking about Venice and what does it mean to be a, make a cinema camera. But this new place that we have is fantastic. You see a couple photos there. We have a standing set. We have a C-LED wall that's connected to a base light. We have a, a, a workflow room. So the idea is as we launch new cameras or we have new software or even a DP is considering a change to be able to come in and do some detailed tests. And instead of driving across town and going to post, we're able to bring up some files and look at everything immediately. Um, so this has been a huge um, thing for us, but it's, it's really the idea that we can prove to everyone what, what it is that we do. And if there's anything that we find in the testing, we're able to report that back to Japan. Um, there's Sam Ferris, and Sam is the, the manager of the DMPC, and he's currently in remote mode, and he's managing the DMPC out of there. So he has a full setup in his garage, uh, and, and we've been utilizing that as the way it's not quite the same as the home court advantage we have at the DMPC, but that's Sam. Um, and uh, along with Katie, who's a big part of our DMPC, we're doing it virtually. So there's a bunch of camera training sessions that we're putting on virtually. And you'll see the list there. If you want to get a list, we can get you the, the website to find and register for that. But it's really the idea is, is do what we can do virtually to talk about um, the camera technologies and operations. Um, in addition to that, we're doing a bunch of social media videos, um, how to set up a Rialto, uh, Venice Connecting Wirelessly. So you'll start seeing those come out. And those will be on sonycine.com. Uh, and that really is is a place where we're starting to really populate with more and more information. Um, this is a, sh a a kind of a update on on some of the shows and projects that we've done. We had we're very happy. We had a few Emmy nominations yesterday um, or a few days ago, I guess. But that was great to see uh, a lot of DPs who are shooting on Sony getting uh, Emmy nominations for cinematography. That's really exciting uh, for the Venice. Um, this is a very very brief overview of the roadmap. As you can see, as we had software releases, um, a lot of there's a lot of stuff being addressed. So the idea about software releases, we continue to uh, bring enhancements to the camera, but what it also allows us to listen to the market and be able to put in features and and improvements that that are that are asked for. If you look at version two, was really where where we really Anybody who shot on version one, I'm sorry, but the, the way we go through software is it has to be rock solid, and then we introduce the, the software uh, version. So we always want everything in the camera, but Japan keeps us pretty honest to make sure that everything works. Um, version three, again, it came up with, with another, another advancement where the big change uh, for the Venice was at version four, and that was in June. And that required a hard, some hardware changes, and, and but now enabled us to do 4K up to 120, and that just became, at 120, that's just a tool that everybody was used to. Um, so that was the big the big go there. And then version five came out uh, earlier this year, and that gave us, one of the keys was flip and flop. And that was another big ask from the community that, hey, I need to be able to uh, flip and flop for Steadicam. Um, and then version six software, that'll be coming in November. Again, some more features that, that um, people have been asking for. Um, this is something that's really funny because version one, version two, version three, version four, when you looked at the side panel, you saw fix 24. And if you look at the little tiny thing, 2398, that is what you are actually in. They couldn't fix the big bold display. So this caused for a lot of concern from people looking at it. Go, Wait a minute, we're supposed to be in 239. No, we are looking at the fine print. We were actually able to fix that in version five. And it wasn't viewed as a big deal um, from our engineers. But I was like, it was such a big deal because it really did cause concern. It was one of the most things we got. Hey, how can I put this thing in the 2398? So we are listening and they are developing and building in the, the improvements asked for by the industry. Um, this is, again, version six in this coming in November. We'll start testing that pretty soon in the next couple months or so. We'll test that at the DMPC. But um, Things like user frame lines and, and a lot of the things that we're, we're being asked to do. Um, people who are shooting either landscape and portrait or simultaneously for a platform like Quibi. 
very popular because of the, the height of our, our sensor, and now we'll be able to have frame lines that will assist in that. Um, these are the frame rates, again, version six, adding more frame rates. Now we have a really robust offering of frame rates. Um, these are kind of the things that we, we always hear back, that the eight-step mechanical optical ND filter system. Super popular because it allows everyone to move quickly. Um, and it was one stop each, which was really a demand from cinematographers saying that we want one stop each. We don't want to skip, because every time we skip, we have to put something in front. So this has been by far one of the most um, uh, hyped um, features of the camera. Another thing is dual ISO. So we were able to give the camera uh, uh, ISO 500 and 2500 and, and the same noise floor. So this is really um, been a great addition to be able to shoot in low light at nighttime and then go back during the day when it's bright to be able to change the ISO. Um, the other thing is the sensor. Um, we're able to do Super 35 or full frame. And this is something that as we see the market moving to full frame, either uh, they want that as a, a look and that want to go all full frame or you want to use some shots of full frame that the Venice is able to utilize either full frame uh, or super 35 millimeter lenses. So it's really been from a flexibility standpoint, creativity, you one of the other. Uh, you know, lens mount on the camera, but if you go under there, there's actually an e-mount. And there are a bunch of e-mount lenses available. And this, this becomes important if you're going into tight cases and you want to be able to reduce the, the weight or the, the length of the camera. And we'll show you a little bit about uh, project where that was used. This is an interesting piece. So we talked about moving and we're going into post-COVID. This is something that people have been using. It's a fancy CBK WA-02, um, which is the uh, adapter, but allows us to get wireless LAN control over the camera, um, which we're finding more and more people are, are taking advantage of this. Um, but it also allows us to combine this with a CBK WA-100. Um, and that allows us to take clips directly from the camera into our cloud platform. So now every start and stop is a clip. Those, those clips are small proxies, about nine megabits per second is the largest. With um, the file name will match back to the high res. So now essentially you could be wherever you set up on the network and gave them access to see, uh, they would be able to see those clips coming in, no pun intended, and then you would be able to edit once you when you're able to put. Uh, string outs together, you put a EDL, and then when you have a high res come in, you can be able to match it back because all of your your file naming is is identical. Um, this is the biggest thing I think that that really from uh, listening to customers and, and adding something after the camera was pretty much designed was the Rialto. Um, and the Rialto sometimes it gets confused. I think it's another camera, but it's actually an accessory for the Venice. Um, it converts from a regular Venice to Rialto mode in about three minutes, and we get it up to 18, uh, 18 feet from the body. Um, this is a quick little tutorial on how we go through it. We remove some bolts. We separate the, the sensor from the body. We attach the Rialto faceplate and put the um, sensor back in the housing. And then if you would like, we, have, we went through, and again, one of those videos I mentioned earlier, we have this available, and, and our DMPC team was able to create a video on how to. So it's really useful to get your head around how do we do this. This is probably the most you know, interesting application of it that we have out there right now. In the early days, if you look at that array of, of Venice cameras and you look at there, again, they're using the E-mount lenses to be able to save a little bit on, on uh, uh, weight and, and, and space in the cockpit. And then this is that shot. So we're actually looking at that output. Um, you can see Dan Ming there. Uh, that is the output. This is a shot that was taken from that. And then um, our DMPC manager, Sam, he went up and he flew that no, he didn't fly the plane. But this is Sam. And actually, if you like, there's, there's some Zoom backgrounds. Should have probably brought one of those up. But there's Zoom backgrounds that Paramount put out that you can actually download. And then you can be um, either Tom Cruise or Sam <laughs> flying in that uh, fighter jet. Not a lot of time to go here, so we just, if you want to go see a great BTS, there's the Top Gun BTS video. Um, this is our friend Maddox. Here he is on Snowfall, and this is another 
probably one of the more popular applications, which is pumping. Right? Max talked a little bit about that. It's another shot where they rigged it in a library, and this is the, the shot down from, from the library. Um, and that's it for the slideshow. Okay. Well, that's Ooh. great. That was probably the fastest technical description of the history of the camera <laughs> that I have ever heard. Well, I told you it would be because I want to get to Maddox and, and Chad and Brad and talk about the good stuff. Yeah, we huh? like so, war stories. stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, then let's not waste any time. Let's bring Tommy in on this discussion. Let's go with the easy question, which is why Sony? Why Sony Venice? Where did you come from? How did this happen? It's, a, it's an interesting conversation. Brad has been on the journey with me about this for a minute. Um, you know, I was shooting Alexa before, which is a great camera. Um, and I've shot the F55 over the years. But when I was at Camera Homage, uh, there was a, a information little demo with Claudio Miranda and he did this whole, like almost like a walk and talk, lighting a set in this gymnasium. And he talked about this camera and him testing it out. And I was like, hey, I mean, the, the guy can't fail. I mean, he shot something on the Sony F900 of this little kid, this short film that was absolutely stunning. And it's like, he did that on the F900. He shot multiple cameras. I've seen him stuff with the shot with the Viper. It's like, you know, Claudio can take any camera, you know, much like certain cinematographers and make magic happen, but the camera looked great inside the gymnasium. You guys are projecting, I think on like a 40, like a 35 foot screen or something while he did this demo. And uh, upon coming back from camera Maj, Keslo had a, a demo and I just happened to have a job the next week. So I was like I to Keslo's uh, demo as well. And I saw it and, you know, I asked some questions. I looked around. I had my ACs with me uh, that time. And I was like, all right, let's give it a whirl in this commercial. And I did a national spot with it. And it was like version, maybe it was a version, was a version one of the software. Yeah. So, and it was only had 500 ISO and everything seemed to go great. And I was like, all right. And then I had another promo shoot uh, two weeks after that. And then I think another software update came and I was like, all right, well, let's let's try it try it again and it was like in that time there was a lot of exterior and i shoot stuff you know a lot of black skin tones i was dealing with and when i had it outside and we had the 500 iso version of it i think we could boot up to the 25 but the fact that i was outside and i was holding skin detail right at about like you know 25 ire by stopping down and i was still holding sky color I said, okay, that looks pretty good because usually you're kind of like in the digital realm, you clip out, right? So the, the, the curve is pretty steep. So when I saw it on this, this other job, we had the second one and we were doing a lot of uh, black skin tones outside during the day and I didn't have to sacrifice the sky to be at close to clip point and I'm still holding it. I was like, well, that's great. Then we had nighttime interiors. And I had a, a black gentleman's like as dark as my hair. And yet I noticed that when I went to 2,500, I was getting lower and lower. I was like, wow, it still feels really bright. But yet on set, it was really dark. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like, and we're not crushing. And it was like, I had my DI with me at the time. And it was like, it doesn't feel like it's crushing. It's like, you know, it still looked like there's information there. And I was using the waveform at the time. And I was like, wow, okay. So then from there, I was like, you know what? let's go for it. And we shot this nighttime interior after the daytime. And I was like, I really like this camera. And then I had huge in France and I was like, okay, let's, uh, let's try it out for the show. And I was like, let's try it anamorphic. And sure enough. So at that point I shot spherical and anamorphic on this camera in a matter of like three months. Wow. And I shot it in Paris as well for the other portion of the show, Paris, Belgium, and New York. And, uh, and in New York, what was interesting was I only could get one Venice because of just availability. But I had an F55 with the back-end recorder, the 4K back-end recorder on it. And in post, they got them pretty close. Like, it ended up working out. But the Venice as a workhorse and having it in multiple countries in a matter of, like, five months and seeing where it was landing and the, the problems and stuff that we talked about with the Sony engineers years before – seemed to really been listened to and worked out because the same people that when Sony came to Keslo years before that, and they were like, what don't you like about the 55? 
my DIT at the time, my ACs at the time, like read in the riot act. And I went through it. I was like, yeah, this doesn't wear the delay in the focus situation, the transmission and the color space seems pretty cool to flesh tone. But like when you deal with the Venice, it is like spot. It's not an interpretation of flesh tone. It kind of is what you see. Like I've talked to other cinematographers like Rodrigo Prieto and Paul Cameron about it. And they all have had great results. Cause like what you see is what you get, but then you can light much faster because you know the accessibility at the 2500 but even at the 500 the camera performs really well in low light you know that bottom end is is great but think and my skin tone doesn't have to be sacrificed if i'm doing a day exterior to grab the sky wait till post and i'm able to you know hold all that detail so then i can nuance the sky as well as the skin tone that's something if you watch snowfall i really take you know advantage of the fact that i have so much and the top end while I'm still holding the bottom end of the information that we do some really interesting stuff. I see contours and clouds while I have my different flesh tones of, of black cast as yeah. well as white cast. And I'm not sac I'm not lighting it. I really don't pull out lights during the daytime for exteriors. I may diffuse a little bit, but for that show, I can kind of run and gun and, uh, and be very happy with the results. I, I, I know I have the information and I can nuance the hell out of it and post if I need to you know, quite easily. So. I, a quick question though, back to when you mentioned about the softwares and especially early on, you were getting new softwares. Mm -hmm. Was was Keslo as a rental house updating the software for you? Was oh, Chad they were, involved? Yeah. How, did, how did that play out? Because I'm assuming you didn't have enough time to go back to yeah. Sony or you weren't like just some wizard. I mean, the DIT. It was a, yeah, it was <laughs> a thing that there would have to be a discussion between the ACs and it'd be like, Chad would come to the room. Brad would be there, call over Chad. And then we get on the phone with Dan and like, <laughs> what is available? Quote unquote, what's available to be let go in order for this next job. They would like to try out this. Dan, is it okay? Uh, let me call you back. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chad would come in and then he would talk to my ACs about, you know, all right, let me reboot it. And then this is what's available now. So it was always like, what's available now? What's available? So when I went overseas, they had just kind of caught up in Paris, uh, over at Vantage. And so I was kind of like, we we're still in the same wheelhouse in terms of the, the hardware and software update. And, you know, I even switched lenses over there just because of what was available at Vantage at the time. And it was, it was easy. Like the, the, the fact that Sony listened to what ACs complained about with the former products made it that much easier for me to go into a foreign country where there's a bit of a language barrier and still operate the same way I, I, I did when I was in the States. And then from there, I went to like, you know, another foreign country and then I went to New York. So it was like multiple crews and I didn't miss a beat on the same show and the producers are totally happy so that I'm using this new camera product and that even though there's stuff going on behind the scenes with Chad and, and Dan and everybody, I wasn't able to look. Cause that's something that producers always will say new camera. Oh man, things are going to go down. The camera's never gone down on me. It's never overheated. I haven't had that issue yet. And it's like, so to not lose time to cost the producers money was a real, you know, a testament to Sony because as we all know with other camera products at times that we won't name, it's like you get a new product and then it's all of a sudden it's like, Oh, we're having issues. The AC's like, I need, I need, I need a minute. And a minute turns into 45 minutes. It turns to an hour. And the producer's like, why did we get this new camera if nobody knows how to use it? And that becomes a no-no. And that will get you chipped. Like as a, as a DP, that's going to get, you can point your fingers at the AC's all you want, but they could be like, you chose the camera and you convinced us to, to use this new product. And now it's costing us even more money. But that hasn't happened thus far. I've, I've switched three shows to the Venice and you I had, haven't had the camera go down at all. When we were talking earlier this week, you had mentioned that there was a show that was using another manufacturer's camera and you have a good relationship with your post house. And you said, mm -hmm. I can make this seamless. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of ironic that I was getting pushback from a show within the same studio and unbeknownst to the post-production supervisor, did they not realize that like I'm in post on another show for the same studio? So they questioned the fact if I knew what the post workflow and deliverables were 
for the studio, I was like, don't you know I'm on another show for this, the same studio? <laughs> I was like, it doesn't make any sense. So I do know what the deliverables are. And they're like, well, why change it? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It sounds like laziness to me when somebody says that. And it's like, because it's new technology. You're using a, a you know, a 10 year old camera with color space and file sizes that, you know, you know, behind me is like, you know, is I put up Hulu with Snowfall. Like the years later, it's gonna to need to be up if you're using an older camera. So it's like, should it, could it be done? Sure. Is it gonna look its best? No because you guys are shooting at 720 versus I can capture compressed with the Sony Venice at 4K and not be using that much more space and still hold my color space and the file size. So then it's future proof to be broadcast as things keep changing. So it's like, why not have more dynamic range so I can hold color space with this black cast that was going on and then I can go that much faster. You know, I, I said I can go 20% faster and sure enough, I did. It's like, I've been using the camera for years and it's a better product and it's giving me the latitude in order to nuance all these gorgeous brown skin tones that you guys have in the show. And it got all the way up to the top and the showrunner totally defended me, my friend Senna. And she was like, if that's what the painter wants to use as a paintbrush, why are we fighting this? And sure enough, there was no problems in post because the post supervisor from that show called the one on, on, on Snowfall and was like, what's the difference? And it's like, nothing really. Right. You know, the Sony had figured it out. Sony listened to what needs, we need certain type of file sizes that are easy to work with in post and easy to get it out and to turn around those cards because in post and you know, on set, we need to turn around cards before we can erase things and the cards come at a, a cost. So that time is cost because you need to get more cards. So it's like this whole thing compounds on itself and Sony listened to what is the best way, what would ACs like, and what do we need on set to be functional and to turn stuff around. I mean, that was the biggest issue with the F65 is like gorgeous image, ton of like information, but it's like that turnaround, I might as well go to Photochem and develop, develop film, you know, and turn around <laughs> for, it's like, sure, the image is stunning. The, the, the F65 images were stunning when people got to use it, but it was just like that turnaround was crazy. So all of us were like, no way, I'm not going to do that because we would have to rent more cards from Brad and, <laughs> and he's going to say, there's no way I'm going to give you a discount <laughs> on a bunch of these cards so then you can turn it around because they're coming at an astronomical price to the rental house. So all these factors, you know, is what the Venice really kind of closed up and makes it a great camera because I can download it on a, you know, a laptop and push it through workflow into drives and be in the field and do it, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. And if I need to switch down to 2K, it's quite easy to do that. It's like, you know, all these, you know, spherical to anamorphic is a push of a button. You know, I don't have to do all this other stuff. So that's what makes it, you know, more advantageous for us to, to really go after, you know, this particular camera and then to have all that room and, and, the, and the signal itself and the color space, it's, it's awesome. The functionality was listened to, what we need, because otherwise, you know, it's a, it's kind of a single man show. You know, Tommy, if I, can I just ask a question? Yeah. To, with you as a DP lighting, what do you find lighting off camera or the EVF? Um, or yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. So, so I noticed immediately with the new viewfinder system on the second job that I did, it's like the, it's, a, it's an OLED, right? It's, a, what, what, it's an OLED viewfinder and I was able to gauge exposure through the viewfinder. And I love the fact I was like, oh, it's not, I could hit the false color. I could do that. That's where I usually like to do my exposure range. But the fact that I can look at an exposure and not hit the false color through the viewfinder and be pretty much dead on is awesome because viewfinders can get funky and it's not always the most accurate way to do it. But when I looked through the, the eyepiece and I was on that second job with the camera, that was something that I really, really loved because I was testing it out. I would stop down. I would go to where I thought, and then I would look at the waveform and be like, oh, snap, uh, like, you know, that works. Now I'm strictly false color with the camera because I think it sees even further than what a waveform does, you know? Wow. So I, I'm all about false color and, and other things in order to gauge exposure. But that is another big plus. So if you're in the field to gauge your exposure through the eyepiece with this camera, it's it's awesome you you should not have a problem at all i haven't had a problem i've done it all over the globe at this point so you know dan was that a big deal for sony to make sure that it was an oled uh viewfinder 
a proper viewfinder, which is something that we heard, you know, over and over and over and over since the F900 day. Um, and so it was something that, again, addressing the needs of all of the people in the crew, the ACs, the the, op, the, oper, uh, the operators, and that was a big deal for us to be able to make a proper viewfinder, I guess, is, is really the, the end of it all. Yeah. And you know what I found on the F55 that was troublesome was there was a lag. And that's one thing I looked for immediately. It's like when I would pan like this, it was like it was catching up to after the actor, somebody threw the line. And I remember doing that on, I figured which job I was on. I had the F55. And I was like, I like the way it like looked because I had taken over show years ago for somebody. But it was just like this lagging eyepiece. And then the AC is like, I'm, I'm catching up. They're like, I think I got it. You know what I mean? So it was one of those things like, does that, you know, it, did they fix it? And immediately we saw that you guys had definitely addressed it. And I, I haven't seen an issue. I can ask my ACs, but I definitely know when I've operated, I haven't seen any lag when they're pulling focus. I haven't heard any. I think people tried to say there was at one point. So I'm like, why don't you show me? And sure enough, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, and I think people just brought over what they experienced from the F55. To the Venice. It's stuff that's, yeah, to the Venice. And it's just like, that's just not, yeah. it's not true. I've, uh, I've worked with this camera too many times to know that's not true. Before I bring Keslo more into this conversation, I just, the one other thing is the in-camera filters. I mean, mm. total game changer. Is it a full range? Like what? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. Uh, the one thing that was always in the HD realm of everybody with red and Alexa was always this discussion of what's the proper ND filters to use. So you don't have color shift. What's the, are these true indies for this, well, for this camera is better than this. And then so, uh, people have certain theories, uh, ND IRs. And then it was like, well, we don't have enough of those to do both cameras. So it's like, oh my <laughs> gosh. So, so some of these are going to be a discrepancy. And then the NDs mixed with the polarizer different manufacturer all of a sudden you have skin color shift that was just not you know acceptable yeah and the fact that there's a calibrated internal nd from 0.3 to 2.4 right it's 2.4 that's calibrated for that chip and it's neutral and i don't see any shift and i can stack the mess out of them and not have any shift is awesome you know for me i'm always looking for funky glass to try to use depending on the story like something different so i just leave the map box off a lot of times because I, the ND that I usually use is inside of the housing at this point, then I can get all flared up. And unless I don't wear, I'm like, you can leave the map boxes off because I, I chose these lenses for certain artifacts. And if I cover it up, you know, I don't have to hold a filter. So I can totally take advantage now optically of some of the choices I've, I've made, you know, mm -hmm. so that's just great. And I can, and I can control it either remotely, the changing of the NDs, or I can walk up to the camera and do it and not have to explain myself to anybody. I mean, that's always a big thing for us DPs is like, when you ask an ACs to do stuff at fly and whatnot, it's just like, and especially if it's a new crew, like sometimes people want explanations for your creative choice. And it's like, <laughs> I don't have to explain myself. I'm just gonna do it. And yeah. it doesn't change the weight for the Steadicam operator. The Steadicam operator is not rebalancing. The, the crane operator is not necessarily have to like, you know, rebalance themselves. I could just push the button or do it remotely on the, on the iPad. And it's like, chick, 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 no one can, you know, question my, my decision making or the LUT, you know what I mean? So it's, it's one of those things. But that internal D is awesome. And it switches super fast. It's not like a lag. It's like, you know, while they're putting a slate in, I'll go ahead and change my ND and, you know, totally know where I want to be at. Yeah. Do you let your AC know? <laughs> no. Uh, I don't have to. <laughs> it's like, okay. hey, he works for me. You know, I love my AC. <laughs> I, as long as I know what the exposure is and I'm I'm swapping it, then they don't have to go to the bag and get anything. They don't have to stop production. Because think right. about it. To stop everybody, they got to go to the bag or have it ready, put the camera back down, pull what other indies out in order to make something else work or vice versa. That's all time. And now the actor's sitting there like, what are we doing? What are we waiting for? Oh, hold on. There's a camera suit. Nah. Yeah, slate in? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Sure. Well, then that leads me to asking about Keslo. I mean, uh, fan, you're a big fan. Is it because of the way they take care of you? And oh. do your ACs like it? You know? I mean, Keslo came because another camera house kind of uh, crapped the bed on me on a job. So it, it, 
I literally was in the middle of a feature for a studio, small movie, and I let one camera house bid uncontested. And what I mean by uncontested, uh, I they got to be the sole person to say, hey, they'll give me a number and what I was going to do with them. But they took a week, came back with the number, production okayed it. An hour and a half later, they called back and said they couldn't do the job for that number. And I was like, okay, uh, so how does that work? Like you got to bid uncontested for a week and then you came back and retracted the number. All right. And then the producer walked me into Keslo's new facility in Culver. And I think I met, I met you, Brad, like immediately. So Brad was like one of the first people I met. And then I met Robert Keslo and Robert's been friends with my mentor, Johnny Simmons for, I don't know how long, like, you know, when, I guess when, when uh, Robert was renting cameras out of his garage, Johnny Simmons used to do music videos and like pull stuff out of there. So he's always talked positively about him and, you know, it's been nothing but a very inclusive environment. I mean, I see people of color and women in so many different facets and I love it. It's just like, it's not an old establishment of a rental house. So with that type of experience, you know, culturally, as well as just like the customer service, it was totally cool. And they always give me what's available. It's like, sure, we can make it happen. Like, you know, and they'll, if they got to say, how oh, no, we have that on hold for something. Like they're just honest with the discussion and we work it out. So what do you have? And they'll just lay it out for me. And, you know, Chad always comes in and checks in and Brad, if there's something new and interesting, Chad will walk it in. You know, those guys walk in bracketing and different stuff and you should try this out and, it's just, uh, it's just it's quite great. I mean, I love it. I, I recommend it to a lot of people this day and age uh, to, to check out Robert. So you Kevin mentioned, for, sorry, you mentioned um, bracketry and specialties. Mm -hmm. How is that, how is that possible? Like Chad and Brad, how are you able to, you know, you are, it is very well known that you have great like cages for other cameras. You have great backs, you have as I like to say, fantastic widgets that seem to really be what the ACs want. I hear that over and over again. And so how, how did that become a thing for Keslo? And then specifically, how, how does that relationship with Sony work? It's really a testament to the forward thinking of Robert Keslo and empowering the team to really push the envelope. Um, our Kessler Cameras research and development team led by Mike Kramer is bar none, like amazing, really out of the box thinking and pushing the envelope. When it came to um, the Sony Venice, it's like the camera has certain contours and you could just tack on, you know, a piece of aluminum on it. But Mike and his team really went above and beyond to hug the contour lines of the camera to make it almost look like it's part of the actual camera that you'd come out of the, out of the cardboard box from Sony, having all the extra PowerPoint points that the camera systems need to power all their accessories. Um, and and uh, as far as um, going to the Rialto cage, like taking the actual Sony stock cage off and, and making a whole new unit, which I think you saw in some of the, the behind the scenes Top Gun yeah, things, all your cheese plate holes and things like that. Recently, um, for our Northern friends, you know, that deal with the snow and freezing cold, they went into the, the EVF, you know, Simon and the, the team in Japan, really opened up um, the drawings of the internal workings for the EVF so we could go in there and add heating elements for, again, for the people that are dealing with snow and, and fogging in the viewfinder and, and battery, you know, functionality and things like that. So they really went above and beyond and Chad can obviously chime in and add to that, so. Yeah, so, I mean, when it comes to Sony specifically, they really went above and beyond as far as collaboration with them. Our ideas and, uh, and their knowledge of their systems really allowed us to really kind of tune things um, to the client's needs. Uh, Brad mentioned the, uh, the heated EVF, the power systems, the, the Rialto systems. Sony was in uh, a very important part of each one of those. They, they uh, would guide us and we'd say, yeah, that, that works just fine with us. Um, and we've collaborated with them. Honestly, this collaboration has been second to none in my entire history of working in this industry um, when it comes to Sony. They, they really went above and beyond. Dan and Simon, I, you know, I, I'll call them. And even if they're in a meeting, I, I'll get a text from Dan and he'll say, I'll call you in 10 minutes. And he'll call right back. And Simon, the same thing. Every time we have a question, we have a, you know, we, they're mechanical things. They, something goes wrong. I get these guys on the phone and 
we have a solution for the client and for us moving forward. And we just document this stuff. Our, our thing with why we have all the right gear and we're still working on that because nobody's ever perfect is we listen to the client. And this is what Sony did with the Venice. We listen to what the clients want. We deliver what we have. We actively go out and do that research with our clients that are on the floor here in Culver city. We have 19 prep bays. Obviously they're not all full right now, but in our heyday last year, we were out of room multiple, multiple times during the year. And uh, we get a lot of feedback and we take that feedback and we just make more stuff with that. So, um, but when it comes to Maddox, I mean, he's got some awesome ideas. It's not just, you know, his crew, it's him and his ideas, what he wants, his vision. And that's the biggest part of the collaboration. I, I would like to talk to Maddox about is, especially with Freddie and the, and the lens yeah. <laughs> come up with some of your projects. It's, a, it's all out of necessity. One thing that we should talk about when it comes to Local 600 and IATSE is safety, right? So there's always a big, a big thing about camera operators who do not operate in that front seat doing car stuff, you know? But with the Rialto, I take the block, I put the, ba- the body on the floor, and my key grip, Bobby Thomas, he's awesome. Like, Bobby can hook it up on a couple of Apple boxes and a 3 8 pin and do a profile shot of somebody we've done it in 10 minutes and did a nighttime interior car driving and i think maybe i maybe put like a led little tiny strip and drove and we could see this black man driving through the streets late into the night and a 10 minute car rig or like on the outside and move it around quite easily like and still have the actor do it being unobtrusive like literally the footprints like my hand and he has a clear windshield except for one little you know it was like five by five block and i can do the nighttime interior driving around and when you have real you know folks that really know what they're doing like you can get away with the nice job the the my focus puller in the back seat with the director so it's like you know they can still be operating throw focus make it about timing go through the dialogue and you know the footprint is so small and it's safe for the operator themselves and say and so there's no because there's no operator and it's safe for the actor because they're really not obstructed in terms of view with our you know convoy of people going on that's great i mean that's what that's a win for for everybody you know i've been i've done it i've pulled it off many many times that you know with the rialto of it all there's some safety concerns that you can you know avoid and it's just great i mean i love it and I think, uh, and I'm sorry, I haven't been showing your pictures, but um, I think something else that you mentioned is that didn't the Sony execs actually come to your set and see how things were working along with Keslo? Yes, yes. So uh, the first visit we got was years ago with the F55, upon which my same majority of my same crew, just about two thirds of the same people, we got revisited on Snowfall last year from the you know the engineers from Sony and it was absolutely great like you know they saw and I could, I showed them like what I'm doing in the field you know and that, uh, we were doing that daytime exterior where what I said earlier I showed them like I have one black male who's as dark as my facial hair and another one that's same complexion as I am but then I had them against the sky and I still have contours and clouds gray white against blue sky and I didn't have any HMIs on I don't turn them on but yet I was able to by simply exposing no grad filters, none of that. And I was able to hold the whole detail. And I was like, that's a testament to the camera. Because a lot of the cameras is going to be what's called clip out and the sky's just going to go white. And then post will be trying to grab what they can to finesse the sky against them. But it's like, no, I had skin separation as well as sky separation, sky detail. And it's, uh, you know, it's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. If I could add something, Maddox has been able to surround himself with some of the best crew around and oh yeah and his camera assistants i mean we put them in touch with the sony engineers and they were taking copious notes so a lot of what you see in the user interface in the venice was because of alex and prentice and and the team that maddox has put together when they when the sony engineers come we're putting them in touch with maddox's crew because they're the ones that give the really in-depth feedback yeah i mean you have to because they have to make like alex and prentice you know prentice smith and alex Lim are awesome and it's like you know but 
you guys had such a culture at Keslo. You watch Dan Ming. Dan's always giving notes about something. Oh, snap. <laughs> Oh, that was my mom. <laughs> and uh, these guys are always giving notes about just everything. And it's like, you know, that's just the part of the culture. Because of the fact that it's like an open hardware that Alex was able to get in and put the iPad remotes, you know, and, and talk to interface the camera was great that they left it as an open platform. You know, it's a testament to the manufacturer that we're leaving it open so you guys can, you know, people can still figure things out. Even in the color space, like, you know, I have, you know, I create LUTs for it at times and it's just, you know, it's good stuff. But my, my ACs are always trying to, you know, they don't want to slow down if I have last minute adjustments. That's the biggest thing as a, as a DP that, you know, I don't want to have to explain my last minute adjustments about certain things, but we just got the camera team has to be able to follow suit and get behind me and, you know, excuse me, and get it going. Like, we just got to make it happen. You know. Maddox, if I can ask another question, just on the on the sort of low level, um, when you were doing those night, night scenes, mm -hmm. sort of ISO settings, um, what lamps you use, how did the camera perform at sort of that lower level with the, with the complex skin tones and uh, you had? Oh man, it it's a uh, it didn't matter if it was incandescent or LED. The camera does a really good job without having major shift issues in terms of color mixing. Cause I, I use incandescent LED much like most folks, but I'll mix them up in the same shot. And the, as far as the color space, it holds it great. Cause I'll use the incandescent as like a backlight or ripping through the street and then I'll LED the foreground and, you know, or just practical the foreground. Mm. And with practical the foreground, I'm still able to, to key brown skin tones quite nicely you know and it's like I, I do a lot of mixed lighting and the camera differentiates it doesn't just bleed the color doesn't just it's like i do have color separation on the same face which is something I, I really love to do and it's like okay but that the camera can interpret it the way that i see it or the way that i want the LUT to still work and still you know not muddy it up and nuance it is absolutely great you know so the, i think we have a picture of like a couple of the uh, I do. Let me see if I can. You'll have to excuse my. I'm going to share my screen, then I'll pop this open. Um, you know, if I could add to is 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 from our engineers coming out and visiting. It's 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 so impactful when you're able to give that information directly to our engineers or our product planning. Simon, who's on on the call as well. It, 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 Again, when anytime you call me, Maddox, my next call will usually be Simon um, to get the answer. But it was um, the idea that we listen to you guys all the time, but when you're willing to tell them directly, it just has an impact and we're able to see the results. And it's it's just really rewarding to us to be able to work with everyone and, and see it show up in a product. It's, it's always really, really rewarding. Are you able to see this one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you guys, as you can see, I, I keep the camera rated at 25, even during the daytime. A lot of times I keep it at 2,500. Uh, but I was able to photograph, you know, one of our, our leads. She's my same skin tone, but I'm at 0.25 foot candles, you know, which is astronomical. And it broadcasts. That's straight from the telecine. You can see there's different colors on her face. You can see the, the joint in her hand. You see it totally nuanced. That's straight down the barrel coming at us, that's 0.25, you know, and it, and I color correct with uh, Pankaj, who's at Technicolor, he does a great job. Um, and we color correct on 35 foot screen uh, inside of tech. And I don't see any noise dancing around. I mean, you still have detail in like the cupboard back on the left-hand side, there's still objects you can see. And uh, you know, that's a, a testament. And you still see even her other eye that's all the way in shadow, there's still, you know, detail there. It's, it's great. I mean, when I did that with my gaffer, Justin Dixon, it's like, we were like, wow, the camera held up because during the false color of it all, I'm looking, I'm looking, I have my false color meter a certain way. And I'm like, oh, all right, let's try it out. And sure enough, I was like, and then I call a Pankaj and I said, did that work? And he sent me back the stills. He's like, oh yeah, I totally saw it. What, what was up? I was like, I was 0.25 foot candles. It wasn't even a full foot candle of light on the a brown skin tone. They would probably, I mean, you'd need a flashlight to walk around on set without yeah. I mean, it's so dark. Yeah. And but that must just, go ahead. Go ahead, Ann. No, I was just going to say that must really speed things up, though, as well. If you're, you know, lighting that quickly, yeah. 
yeah. and getting a lot of setups in. So the studio it, it totally like does. That. Yeah, I mean, I can because it's LED, then I can nuance it quickly with Justin about what I'm thinking, so I can talk in terms of how I feel about the scene or what's going on or what we're foreshadowing for the next episode or what's going on with this character. So when you could talk about, you know, feeling an emotion, then you, I color it a certain way, I approach it a certain way. And then to be able to just do it and you're like, you know, at 10 points of light on LED fixtures, maybe 12 points of light down to like seven or eight. It's like, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that is, is great to, to be able to go after the way you emotionally feel about the scene versus like, I need 25 foot candles for a T2, 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 it, you know what I mean? It's like, that's the way you got to do it. Cause that's the way it has to be exposed. Otherwise we're not going to see anything or it's going to muddy up and start dancing. And nah, it's great. It's absolutely great. I, I just have to share this one too. I, I just love, this is the Rialto. So. Um. Yeah. So, I mean, here, th this is how great you can get with the Rialto. So this is just simply a, a slider, right? Skateboard wheels looking straight down with the 8R. You know what I mean? And the, the rigging grip, Lee, who's awesome. And we did this in a small, it's actually a bookstore. So that's why we had to do it because there's only like two inches of clearing above it. But that I came up with this shot with the director, like what if we like tracked across all the book stacks and found the lead actor there as he's trying to like gain knowledge. So like, we showed duration that he's, you know, he's in search of knowledge by showing all these books and then you land on him in the middle. So that's Prentice, my first AC, Prentice Smith on the left with his, uh, the shameless Keslow plug there. <laughs> <laughs> and then my key grip, Bobby Thomas, uh, both good, good people, experienced guys, good, good brothers. So Excellent. yeah. Oops. And then this, this is great to talk about too. So this is when I talk about Sony's open platform, Alex Lim and, uh, Prentice were able to talk to Chad. You helped with this, right? Did you help get this up, or was this an Alex project? I, it was probably Alex and possibly uh, Scott, who's our workflow specialist here. Okay. So what you guys are seeing here is like two mini uh, tablets that are synced into the camera controls. So then, what I'm playing with my NDs, depending on which way the camera's you know pointing, I'll. I'll go ahead and have certain types of levels of ND and whatnot for exposure, but I can control it all here remotely, which is awesome. You know what I mean? I can even control the LUTs. And it's just like to have that as a DP at the monitor, as you see the two monitors at the bottom, then all of a sudden it's like, it's a game, even the shutter angle and color temp, I can make all these decisions without slowing anybody else down and requesting for things out of my ACs when I'm like, oh, I want to nuance this. I want to nuance that. I got my iris control Oh, at this stop. I may want to nuance. Okay. And the camera that the, the operators may hear like switching before we roll. But the only thing you'll hear is like, you know, really the, the ND if it's turning and you know, they don't mind, they don't really care. You know, it doesn't shake the camera. It doesn't shift it really hard. You know, they just hear it. And then all of a sudden, we're there, we're rolling the camera. I'll, I like literally these guys know I will do it during the slating process just in case I, I feel that I need something different. So I love that. Excellent. Uh, well, it's been good. I, now I know that Johnny is your mentor. Now I know why you're such a great storyteller. That's all I have to say. I wasn't going to say it, but I got to. <laughs> oh, man, you got to love Johnny Simmons. Uh, yeah. So. What, what else do you guys have? There's a couple of the photographs. Let me see. What, car I, hopefully we'll see what, oh, no, sorry. Uh, let me see if it comes up. But. Oh, that's, um, that's with the, yeah, these are with the, uh, is Brad and, and the engineers from Sony who came out and, you know, on set with us at Snowfall. You know, this is great. This is yeah. a good time. And that's, it's so important for me to see how you guys actually work on set. Because a lot of times we'll ask for something and they'll come out and they'll see it and they go, oh, okay, that's why you're asking. So the idea that they come out from the factory and they actually see it firsthand, things that you guys take for granted and, and say, you got to do this. They're like, well, why? And then they see it and, and it really becomes impactful to them as to why they need to do that. And then we usually get something to happen. Right. Cause I mean, that was the biggest conundrum with the F-55 also was that just the sub menu situation and that, you know, the Venice still has a bunch of sub menus, but you don't have to access the sub menus to do basic functions, which was a major conundrum. It's like, I just want to do some, the basic semi stuff that I really want to deal with. 
and mm-hmm. I need it done in a timely manner. And the, the whole issue of sub menus being at the top of everything that offers you all this stuff. And it's like, well, I don't really need all that to, to get going. I, I just need this. And I need this on the camera accessibly easy. And that really came through that's on the operator side as well as, you know, what we call the dummy side. And that really, and now that I can do it remotely anyways, off of my iris is like, you know, off of my iris cart, uh, my DP cart is even, you know, that much better. You know, and it just it helps out in terms of flow and speed, man. That's all, you know, the film business is about money. How, you know, every minute's like, you know, just ticking away and TV being the beast that it is, you know, it's a, it's a tough one at times. That is, you got, you got to tell us about being Mr. 20%. Oh, 20. so on the law on Empire, when I had this whole thing about I can speed the production up, there was like, you know, I, I blurted this thing out that I feel like it could be 20% faster if you give me this camera. And it was like one of those things that, you know, at first it was kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. And then upon, you know, a few months in, our Fridays, if anyone knows television schedule, you know, you start on like 6.30 on a Monday, but then as the hours go up, you know, one hour, you know, 12 hour day, you got the hour lunch, you start to tick up. So by Friday, you really kind of end by 9 p.m., 9 a.m. to yeah, 10 a.m. or something like that. Mm-hmm. So upon which, instead of a lot of Friday nights usually go long to about one or two in the morning. And I was in Chicago, my, my best friends growing up and my college roommate actually were there and we're all buddies. And I didn't want to stick it around. So I was like, I was able to get us out in like 11 hours most days. I was saving tons of money just off a of sheer time of finishing under 12 hours or finishing at 12 hours versus many fratter days, as we call them, didn't exist. And seven months I was there, I think maybe we, we end up doing like two, two or three. So I ended up saving that 20% became a real thing because I was getting us out most days underneath that 12 hour window. So, and that counts for a lot of money. You know, in terms of all the manpower, all the crew, wrapping people out, turning around for Monday, it, you know, the 20% situation uh, was talked to me by some other departments who felt the <laughs> checks out a little, a little bit light. I, there was a real conversation and I was just like, sorry, man. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to slow down because you think that, you know, I want to make more money. It's like, I, there's other things in life besides sitting here on these stages. Like, you know, Chicago is a great city. You know, so yeah, it's a, I I lived up to it. It was great. You know, it was a good time. It was a good chuckle that, but I'm glad I was able to back it up because it's Kessel support, but also because of the manufacturer listening to DPs like myself and, you know, guys like Paul, Cameron and Claudio and all these other guys who have used the product and, you know, they broadcast everywhere. So yeah, I can't thank you all enough. Uh, I do have a question for you. What message do you have for the manufacturers in considering skin tones and the way they develop products? Do you have, maybe Sony seems to have hit it, but is there something more broad that you would like to say or what was it that they- Yeah, I mean- thought? Like, how did you approach that? Man, it's like, I don't, it's, it's funny because I don't know if it's because Sony is a Japanese company that if their standard of gauging skin tones is that of somebody being brown versus being white with, you know, underlying pink undertones and whatnot and the flesh tones, if that, so they're, you know, maybe they're, they're evening it out. If that's who they're gauging their color space and color metrics on, you know, versus Airy is, you know, a German company, you know, do, does Airflight, does Airy make, a great product sure they do but i think the color space is different than it's not bad but i just think it's different than the sony and yeah. the sony when i'm looking at it it's like i want to be at an even plane so that i can manipulate it anywhere i want so as long as i'm not getting an interpretation i'm as close as possible to what brown skin is you know then it's like all right then i can take it to where i creatively want it versus being at the mercy of what the color space already is and then trying to twist it and manipulate it into something I like, you know, it can be a bit more challenging. And I find that with some camera manufacturers that you'll come up with something interesting, but you have to twist their color space that they're already starting at, you know, so you're kind of a foot behind versus I can, I'm at an even plane, then I can take it to where I would ideally like to go emotionally with the story. 
So they should be, you know, people of color of different nationalities from being black American to African to people from India, Japan should be involved in terms of understanding and building your color science and your LUTs with inside the camera and the color space. You know, how does it interpret that? It shouldn't just be based solely on what is a Caucasian skin tone, you know, because there's many people telling stories around the world. So it's like, all right, so let's, uh, I don't know if that was Sony's intention, but I know I've talked to multiple folks and, you know, me and Paul Cameron talked about it. Um, it's like, you know, he did 21 bridges with the, the Venice and he has Chadwick and it looked great. And he's like, what I saw is what I got in the middle of New York. Mm. You know what I mean? And he's saying the same thing I did when I'm shooting shows like on my block and snowfall. And then it's like, yeah, what I see is what I get. And then I take it to, to where I want. You know, so I think you just have to, they have to be more inclusive in terms of even just the building of the technology. What is, you know, get people in there, put eyes on it, but also who are you gauging your color metrics through? What, what gaze in essence are you saying, this is what perfect skin tone should be? You know what I mean? It's a discussion. Well, and here's kind of a question for Dan and Simon. Do you think um, that Sony, because it really has evolved always from a video standpoint that that gave you the leg up going into this versus some of the other companies. Well, you know, that might just have been film cameras prior to that. I think in some ways it kind of worked against us because we had such a history in, in broadcast and making television in, 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 in some ways, I think, I, I think it worked against us. And, and this was a complete, Reapproach to it, Simon. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, the approach that, that we took? Well, I think you got to consider that we make a whole range of cameras now. With, with the uh, marketplace for the alpha cameras is huge, and there's so much technology going into those cameras right now, both in imaging science. That's what's benefited us, both for the high end and the low end. Um, I think that's the big step forward that we've taken. Um, previously, obviously, we had that Jap Japanese look that uh, was catered for the NHK of, of the uh, broadcasters, but um, Venice took it a whole step in a different direction. And we, we listened and we, and we took feedback from the sensor development and just the, the CFA um, design is for, the, uh, for the sensor is, uh, is dedicated more for a cinematic application. So it's um, something we've taken from the, from the market, not just from the high end, but from the low end as well. Simon, this is totally different color science than the 55, is it? Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it uses the same color spaces, but they are uh, everything on the sense is completely different compared to the 55. Right. Yeah. You know, and I had to convince some certain folks that it was, you know, not a rehoused F55. That became a discussion. I was, I was like, what the hell are you talking about? It is. I was like, no, it's not like I've done the side by sides <laughs> and, you know, I've talked to the engineers directly. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh my gosh. Sometimes there's like camera rumors about things that are just like, you know, it's like certain people in politics, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> they have their own life. Not going there, we're we don't have enough time. We're, oh, oh, sorry, we absolutely <laughs> wrapped this. <laughs> no. But that does lead because Dan, I do want you to plug the new um, A7 III. And I, my question is, would Tommy, would you find yourself using that DSLR to intermix um, either for crash cameras or, other methods or are you just i'll only stick with the venice and the rialto and i'll you know like oh, no, I said, I've, I've already done it for the black magic and yeah know. no i've already done it i've already and on empire we were using sony dslrs for crash cameras and housings and uh it worked out fine i've already i've already done it so you know the color space wasn't far off at all and the, i think it was the a7 i think i had yeah. i'm not sure which one and we had a couple of them threw them in there and it worked out the only thing was in the off speed it cropped a little bit at a high frame rate it seemed like it, it jumped in a little bit so that was my my only concern um but just being able to be at a high frame rate and still be able to hold my my full frame is the, the only thing i would ask but everything everything else the flame didn't go just bright white you know what i mean which is as a sure sign of bad video at times when flame gets introduced and as a flame builds and changes and all that sometimes you'll see weird artifacting and you'll see it just go white 
you know, instead of like a flame orange and nuanced and blue to orange and whatnot. And it totally, when the fireball went, it looked, it looked great. All right. I have a question from Carly on YouTube. It's for Tommy. Do you ever use ACES for color when using multiple cameras? Oh yeah. That's a good question. It's the ACES discussion, as I have found out, <laughs> is really a colorist thing in terms of what they would like to use. So ironically, I have Pankaj on Snowfall. Pankaj helped develop ACES to a certain degree for tech and for, for, the, for the academy. But now on Snowfall, Pankaj doesn't use ACES. So <laughs> he feels he gets limited in the box of ACES in terms of color and whatnot, even though I like the idea of future-proofing it, but he feels that he can do stuff at tech to future-proof it down the line. On all my block in Huge in France, I used ACES and I was very happy with the results of what we got. And I was able to, to do things and with the Venice giving me a good base baseline of information, I was able to take, you know, both files where I wanted. And, you know, I started in the in my HDR pass of it all, and it was easy to kick down to, to my other formats. So it's kind of interesting on that discussion because, I mean, I have a person to help kind of develop it in early stages, but now he doesn't use it, but yet his work is phenomenal. And he's like, well, there's other ways to future-proof it. But uh, I like DACES, but I also have a great colors too. It's, it's also a part of who is the operator in terms of, uh, you know, but the future proofing is always uh, the thing. And they let me on Snowfall kick up to the Venice and we were doing like, you know, we're doing our 4K capture. So in that sense, I'm kind of there in terms of the file size and color space for the future of it all. And then a slightly different question. This is really for Brad and Chad. Uh, when you are in, when it, the camera's still being prepped, are you having, is it easy? Do you find that you have some uh, nuances between the two cameras? Are you able to match them before they go out to the field? Um, like, how is that, has that been an issue with the Venice at all for you? Are you talking about the Venice and the A7 or are you talking about the Venice and- Venice and multiple Venices. Multiple, yeah. no, they, they, honestly, they've been the easiest camera to deal with when it comes to camera matching. There are definitely some other uh, camera manufacturers that have their problems when it comes to matching two cameras, especially if the cameras are more than a year old. But honestly, um, Sony has some, I won't call it black magic because that's a whole nother camera. Uh, they've got some very interesting magic going on inside that sensor and the, the processing that uh, makes those cameras track very well together. And it really, Hardly. Go ahead, Maddox. You had something. Yeah. So here, here's a good testament to that is that, you know, Snowfall I used two cameras. When I was doing Empire for the performance scenes, I have five to seven cameras. All Venices. Like, you know, you guys, Brad will tell you, I, I rent seven at a time each week. And then I would go into post. I had no issues on any of the performances on Empire of matching cameras. Zero. That's, I that's, did seven months. Like, and that is a big problem with some other manufacturers. We, you know, go through matching cameras and having to, you know, some cameras you actually have to send back to the manufacturer to get their sensor recalibrated. Not once have we had to do that with the Venice. And I dare to say we have more Venices than pretty much anybody. And that's a testament to Sony as well being, I mean, a huge part of their revenue stream is sensors. So, and maybe Simon can talk about what makes the sensor in the Venice so unique. I don't think we want to discuss too much about the sensor and it's, <laughs> it's well, but uh, obviously we are the largest manufacturer of, uh, of image sensors in the, on the planet. So um, we can manufacture sensors very consistently and that's the key to it it's not it's not batch by batch they vary every batch is very consistent so that's that's critical to uh, the end result yeah and that boot up time was 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 oh. everybody's you know I, I think i had i may have the camera glitch on me once but then just to be able to turn it off and turn it right back on and i'm i'm back up it was like you know that's a game changer considering some of the manufacturers and you know starting to try to shoot out of the box 
Yeah, we, we had talked to a studio and they said, oh, you have to reboot to change something? We said, yeah. And they go, oh, okay. no problem. <laughs> That's nice. I have another question from Carlos off of YouTube. Uh, does Sony Venice bring back nostalgic filmmaking and ease of use that you may have experienced early in your career on smaller productions? I feel so. Because with the freedom uh, of getting to shoot certain ways, you know, I don't have to have 18Ks all the time to shoot a daytime interior. You know, sometimes, you know, Justin Dixon will tell you like there's times that we'll just turn one exterior light on to come through the house and I'll get Xavier, my Steadicam operator uh, and start walking it. And we'll do we'll, like daytime interior with a single source outside because I can hold that much detail. And I never ND the windows. So if anyone's wondering, oh, he's probably ending the window. No, I don't do it. There's enough in the top end that if I expose it the right way, then I can hold my detail out the window and carry these people inside of the place and rock and roll. So yeah, it definitely, you definitely get to lean more to like an indie filmmaking because you have enough room for later on. And I'm shooting it in ProRes. So I can turn the card around. I'm holding the detail. I have the color space and, you know, I have the top and bottom that I can, I can really get through. You should see Elliot Rocket did this one episode um, where they steady camp through a whole house. I think he may have like two lights up on a snowfall. I think it was episode like, I think it was episode seven. He has Xavier downstairs, outside, comes inside, goes up the stairs, finds somebody and brings them all the way back down. And I know they didn't have condors everywhere. I think they only had like, you know, one or two lights and let the camera do the work. You know, so yeah, it definitely does give that like creative indie feeling at times if you just trust it. Like a lot of people have a trust issue with feeling uh, of a camera being able to see that far down and losing detail. No. Well, uh, I would love to keep talking <laughs> and listening to you and keep this going. But I guess uh, I got the little nod saying that this might be where we got to wrap this up. But I want to thank Sony, and I want to thank Keslo and especially Tommy for taking the time out of your day oh, to thanks, no share a little bit more. I, um, I think this is a great thing. I think all we have to do is just watch the three groups talk to each other and you know there's a true relationship there. And I think that's really key because if you can have the manufacturer have the same relationship with the rental house and then the end user being the DP and on set and everybody seems to be happy and smiling. Right. Sony, you're doing something right. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you so very much again. And, um, you know, we look forward to the next one. Stay tuned to see what we're going to be doing next. Thanks for having me, guys.